this one, it has some element of truth, but their conclusion is wrong. So your premise isn't completely ridiculous, but your conclusion didn't really match up with your premise. So the second narrative is the virus is killing more minorities because of racism. Now, is the virus having a bigger impact on minority communities? Yeah, absolutely. That's objective. I don't know of anybody on the right or left that disputes that. I have yet to hear anybody say, oh, they're saying it's affecting black people or Mexican people or Asian people or whatever, you know, throw in whatever nationality or race that you may want to. They'll say that, but it's not because of racism. And there's been no proof of this, yet it's a talking point the left continues to throw out there. There are a number of factors, a large number, actually, of factors that could be a contributing reason why this thing is hitting minorities to a greater extent. And just to go over a few of them here, first of all, there's higher rates of things like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, smoking, all in minority communities. There's also cultural differences. Typically, your minorities tend to be a much closer-knit group. They tend to value family more, which, by the way, that's not a criticism. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a really good thing that you've got a lot of black families where they have two, three generations living in the same town where the kids can go visit grandma and grandpa pretty much any time they want to. That's actually a good thing. I wish that the white community had more of that, but it's also something that's causing a a quicker spread of this thing, and it also causes issues with that, and, and you can see why that would be problematic in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, you also have location, because we were just talking about rural versus urban and how this thing is actually hitting urban communities at a much greater rate and, and much more impactful rate. In, in other words, it's affecting them more than it is in rural communities, well, whites make up 79% of rural areas and make up only 44% of urban ones, which means that the minority communities are primarily in the urban population centers where people are being most affected by this disease. So, of course, they're going to be impacted more because that's where they are. And that's not the only factor, but let's be honest, it's a significant one. If you are where the virus is and where the virus is more easily spread, then of course the minorities are going to be more impacted by that. Another thing that needs to be talked about, and, and this is one that the left will, will kind of talk about and harp on, and I think that it can be a factor, but it's certainly not the only factor. Socioeconomic factors, things like poverty, large percentage of essential workers. So not only do you have higher rates of poverty, but you also have a higher rate of those people who tend to be disproportionately more affected by poverty, you also have those same minorities, those same groups of people tend to have jobs that are considered essential. Things like working in a grocery store, working in a meatpacking plant. Uh, if you're looking at, at agriculture, for example, there is a ridiculous disproportionate amount of Hispanic people working in those kinds of jobs, be they legal or illegal, that are having to, to continue to go to work every day. And of course, that's going to cause a greater rate of infection amongst those particular minority groups. The real issue underlying all of this is that whenever the left sees any kind of disparity, they assume that it's racism. It's not. Not every time. A disparity can certainly be indicative of, a, of racism, but it doesn't necessitate it. Sometimes disparities are just disparities. For example, if you were to look at, uh, you know, something that had nothing to do with racism, you could still create a disparity. If you were to, for example, look at the, and I know that this is a goofy one, but yeah, I mean, it's true. If you were to look at the portion of people that, that pick Sprite to drink, a lot of black people love Sprite. Not sure exactly why. I like Sprite fine. It's probably my second favorite of all of the drinks. Nothing's going to beat Dr. Pepper, though. I'm telling you that right now. Uh, but... Uh, but for whatever reason, they just really like Sprite. So if you looked at a chart, a graph of uh, a person's choice of cola based on their ethnicity, you would see a giant disparity. Is that because the makers of, of all the other drinks are racist? Well, no, it's just their preference. I don't know. It's cultural. It's, they just tend to like the taste better. I don't know what it is. But you can't just assume that every single disparity is because of some kind of underlying 
racism. John Archibald in AL.com earlier was trying to make this exact same case, and he was saying that the reason that it's impacting these communities at a greater rate is because of years and years of systematic racism, and what we should do is expand Medicaid because something, something, something racism, therefore we have to expand Medicaid. Okay, well, I, I don't follow that logic at all, but the, basically the case that he was making is that we haven't expanded Medicaid because of racism. I really don't understand that, especially when you consider that we have a, a pretty substantial black population in the state of Alabama. And I mean, when it comes to Medicaid, there's probably a lot of them that are in favor of it. They tend to vote blue, but we haven't halted that because of racism. We've halted it because it's a bad idea and it would cost the state an awful lot of money. That's what it ultimately comes down to, especially with states that have heavy levels of poverty and people that are on Medicaid, like Alabama, it would be even more expensive for us than states that actually have lower rates of poverty. But that's the argument that he makes. And uh, one of the things that he was talking about there is that we're going to have a much rougher time of it because we have an expanded Medicaid. And because Alabama has an expanded Medicaid, we and the other states that have not done so are going to have a much, much harder time with this pandemic, and this whole thing is a case study in why we should expand Medicaid. Except there's not an ounce of truth to that either. In fact, if you go ahead and look at this list, these are states based on their rate of death uh, as a result of COVID-19. These are the states with the highest rates of death due to COVID-19. And uh, all of the ones that have not expanded Medicaid are in red. Now, you may be looking at that list there and saying, but Caleb, there's not any on that list that are in red. Yeah, that's the point. All of the top 10 states with the highest death rates of COVID-19, not a single one of them have failed to expand Medicaid. All of them have. New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Louisiana, Michigan, Rhode Island, Pen uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Illinois, all of them have expanded Medicaid. So if expanding Medicaid is the key to lowering your death rate of, of COVID-19, obviously it ain't working for all of the states that have the absolute worst rates of that. And by the way, to even get to one that has expanded Medicaid, you have to get all the way down to number 14, Mississippi. And if you'll go ahead and, and look at this next one, these are all the states that have the least amount of COVID-19 deaths. We'll look at the bottom 20 here. And again, every single one that has, has expanded Medicaid, or sorry, has not expanded Medicaid is going to be in red. Huh, awful lot more red in that list. Oklahoma, South Carolina, Kansas, North Carolina, South Dakota, Texas, Tennessee, and Wyoming. All of those states are in the bottom 20. All of those states are in the 20 with the least amount of COVID-19 deaths, and yet somehow none of them have expanded Medicaid. Now, I want you to keep in mind that there are only 13 states, only 13, that have not expanded Medicaid. The other 37 have. And you may notice that eight of those 13 are in the bottom 20. And if you dig a little bit deeper into this, that means that there are 61%, 8 of the 13, that are in the bottom 20 that have not expanded Medicaid yet. And the highest two that haven't expanded Medicaid, like I already said, Mississippi's one at 14th, Georgia at 15th. Those are the highest two. Every single other one in the bottom 25. And by the way, all 13 of them are below the national average. All of them. So if Medicaid is supposed to help us, that's not showing up in the data anywhere. The idea that the reason that Alabama is having issues, and, and we're, I think, 25th, 26th in overall death count because of this virus, the argument that Alabama needs to expand Medicaid to help us with the coronavirus pandemic, that was never going to fly. And John Archibald can make the case that the reason that we're having a hard time of it and the reason that we're getting hit by this thing even though we're about middle of the pack, we're not being hit significantly harder than 
any other states. And, and when it comes to death rates, we're actually doing significantly better than all of our neighbors with the exception of Tennessee. Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, we're doing better than all of them. But the idea that expanding Medicaid is going to be some kind of magic bullet that, that helps us with this thing, no, there's just no truth to that. So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.